So this is my friend and author, Anna Jones, and we're doing a video tonight on our LBL experience. And she's written a short story, and I'm gonna let her read that because she did a great job and she didn't leave anything out. So pretty much says it all, what she has to say. Alrighty. Now I wrote this all about our experience when we went to the LBL, weekend of August 12th to the 14th. And this is everything that happened from the time that we drove down there until the time that we went home. As we shut the back hatch on the white Jeep, my friend Michelle and I knew this wasn't going to be an average weekend camping trip. We were backcountry tent camping inside LBL, or officially called Land Between the Lakes, for two nights and attend the Dogman Paranormal Conference while we were there. For me, excitement mixed with anxiety for multiple reasons. I hadn't tent camped in a long time, and I wasn't sure how my body would handle that due to the permanent physical issues I had after a head-on collision years ago, but mostly because of all the stories I've heard and read about Bob with the eerie goings-on in the wilds of this protected area. It would just be us gals, our tent, and a prayer as we made our way to Western Kentucky. Michelle is an avid hiker and tent camper, spending many weekends over the past two years enjoying her mostly lone outings, frequently in the Red River Gorge area of the Daniel Boone National Forest of Eastern Kentucky. I guess she can thank me or knock me out from smashing her twink, tranquil thoughts of the woodland trails she enjoyed so much. We had gotten together over a weekend to do some canning, and as we prepared food and filled jars, she told me of her recent hike, and somehow the subject came up, and I said two words, Bigfoot and Dogman. She eyed me for a moment, as most people do if I happen to bring up this subject, and told me she'd heard of Bigfoot, but not Dogman, and asked me to explain it better. I did, and her camping and hiking trips from that point on have led to entire new experiences and outlooks for her, but only because she understood what to look for, and she looked and found. Over the late spring and into summer, Michelle would send me pictures of her adventures, including interesting tree breaks, partially hidden faces, and signs. A long-time online friend and fellow author announced that he'd be speaking at a conference for the first time, and it would practically be at Land Between the Lakes. I knew I had to go, and I called Michelle. The tickets were bought and plans set. A girl's trip to LBL was in our future. In the weeks leading up to our trip, we both dug into researching stories of people who'd had experiences in LBL. I had been there once in 2010, but it was for a typical weekend vacation where we stayed at the Lake Barkley Lodge. I had also been friends with a lovely lady that lived in LBL and had many experiences of her own there that she had shared with me over the years. She recently passed away, but I'll never forget her friendship nor the advice, encouragement, and experiences that she shared with me. From her, I knew spending time in the deep of LBL wasn't something to take lightly. This I understood but I really wanted to attend this first Dogman Paranormal Conference. It took us four and a half hours to reach the southern end of LBL and our campsite. Crows literally met us at every turn along the trace, the lone 43 mile road that spans from the north to the south end of LBL. To see multiple murders of crows flying around and sitting along the road towards our destination didn't leave us with a good feeling. The last of the evening sun sparkled along the lake as we entered the campground. There was just enough light left to get unpacked and set up. Of course, the best spots directly on the lake were already snagged, so we chose one that was backed up to the woods to give us a bit more privacy. A few steps away sat a small local cemetery. Goosebumps already, and it wasn't even dark yet. The first thing that stood out to us both was how dense and dark it was along the tree lines the silent sentinels that were the gateway to so many stories and fears. We noticed this driving the trace at sunset and now at our campsite as the shadows lengthened. 
the inky darkness seemed to pour out of the woods, engulfing its surroundings. We hurried to set up camp, trying to outpace the retreating light of the day. Once it became dark enough to need lamplight, we realized in our rush to pack up, we'd forgotten firewood. To the right, on the edge of a tree line, there were very few fallen branches to use, so we gathered as many twigs as we could and added them to the large fire pit. As we hunted for wood for a fire, Michelle paused, sticks in hand, and looked at me and said, Did you see that? She didn't tell me what she'd seen. She wanted confirmation. Yeah, I saw small lights in the woods back there. We both nervously chuckled. Our flames lasted about 30 minutes. As the flames of our small fire began to go out, we turned on what few lights we brought. We both really wished we had a roaring fire going, not for warmth, but for some light. Michelle, with headlamp on, asked if I wanted to go into the cemetery. I paused. I wanted to go, but I knew that darkness, unfamiliar ground, and my legs were not a good combination. The head-on collision years earlier left me with permanent mobility issues and limited range of motion in both knees and right ankle. The last thing we needed was for me to get hurt out here in the middle of nowhere. So I chose to sit tight and not go with her. Her headlamp bobbed across and around the white tombstones as she walked through and lit up the PVC pipe crosses that most likely were there to mark headstoneless graves. The bright flashes of her camera sliced through the blackness as she took pictures. I stiffened from an uneasy feeling that struck me. I tried to shake it off, telling myself that I was being silly and only reacting to old childhood fears of being afraid of the dark. Michelle had backed her jeep in and up close to the picnic table. I sat on the edge of the picnic table bench. Directly behind me was the tent and the woods that wrapped around to my left side. Directly in front of me, past the front of the jeep, was the cemetery, and fanning out from the cemetery to my right was the lake. To the left of me, in my peripheral vision, I caught movement. I didn't jerk my head around to try and catch what was moving, but with a slow, controlled, slight turn of my head, I caught the large, tall outline of a muscular, human-like figure standing about 10 feet inside the tree line. While I'm in the cemetery. Yes. <laughs> While she And is, I didn't know this. No, I did not tell her immediately because I did not want to make her more scared than what was already going on with us. So let me find my place. Sorry, I interrupted. Oh, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> no problem. Well, that part really freaks me out. <laughs> well, all of it freaks me out. The whole experience out. was, yeah. <laughs> the figure had no color at all filled in completely black, blacker than the darkness of the forest it stood in. I have a cousin that is six feet five inches, and this figure stood taller. The outline was more prominent at the top half, the mounded head, large shoulders, muscular long arms. I did not really see much detail below the waist. It turned its head toward Michelle in the cemetery and took one step in her direction. And in doing so, I turned to fully look at it. The figure froze as I stared. A rising fear shot up from my gut and flared out, making me feel flushed. As I pursed my lips together to yell for my friend, her headlamp swept across the exact spot where that dark figure stood, and there was nothing there. She walked a few steps back to our campsite. I didn't speak up to say anything. I talked myself into believing I was only freaking myself out, and there was no need to make Michelle feel that way too. As Michelle looked through the picture she'd taken, I continued to glance at the tree line, but I never saw the figure there the rest of the night. Once she finished her first run through of her pictures, she handed the phone to me. I flipped through them all to get a first impression and then went back through, paying attention to details. For me, one picture stood out, a small bright light beside a tree along the heavily wooded side of the cemetery. I enlarged it and could clearly see a tall figure, partially hidden, peeking out from behind this tree. The bright white light was eye shine. I handed the phone back to her, not telling her what I saw, but kept it enlarged, and asked her to look to see if she saw anything. She looked it over and gasped a little. 
kind of farming, she saw a figure behind the tree with only one eye catching the light as it peeked out. After discussing it and taking a moment to clear our heads a bit, we went back over the photos. The two pictures that clearly show figures were now dark and blurry. We couldn't believe it. I cringed as I watched the dying embers in the fire pit. The thick canopy of trees kept us from seeing much of the sky. The Perseid meteor shower was happening, and I'd hoped that I'd have a dark night and clear view to see them. It was a full moon, too, remember? Yes, a full moon that weekend. Mm -hmm. That just added to the spookiness. Mm -hmm. I got my dark night, so dark the leaves looked like black puzzle pieces blotting out much of the lighter skies. Tiny patches of twinkling stars shone through here and there, but not nearly enough for me to view the meteor shower. Neither one of us was ready to try and sleep, so we passed the time by watching YouTube videos of dogman investigations. That's right, here we are in a backcountry campground in Dover, Tennessee, no fire, already on edge from possible ongoing activity, and this is what we decided to do. Leave it to us to ramp up the spook factor. The cool dampness and mosquitoes finally chased us into our separate areas to sleep, Michelle in her tent and me on an air mattress in the back of the Jeep. To keep my mind occupied until I fell asleep, I watched some favorite shows on my phone. I do this at home every night as well, so it was part of my routine. My body is rarely without pain, and due to this, I toss and turn a lot. I've watched about an hour's worth of shows, and as quietly as I could, turn myself on the air mattress. The back of the Jeep has a small window near the hatch, and I caught the back and forth motion of a dark figure in that window. It moved like someone who was trying to see through a keyhole, peering in while moving their head to try and get a clear view. I did not like that at all. I paused for just a moment, still watching the movement, and I chose not to continue to turn my body in its direction. The hatch on the Jeep wasn't completely closed due to the air mattress's length, and the terrifying thought ran through my mind that something was getting ready to reach in, grab my ankles, and jerk me right out. I wished I'd been able to bring my 9mm, but we were in a recreation area that didn't allow fire. Yeah, they don't allow carry down there for whatever reason. Yeah, you can't protect yourself. Trying to calm myself down, I thought maybe it was the ship, but it was pretty quiet in this campground, and I did not hear her unzip her tent to come out. I did not hear anyone walking in the gravel. All I heard were the night songs of the cicadas. I pulled my legs up against me as much as I could and settled on the fact that my screams would alert Michelle and the small handful <laughs> of other campers that were there. I focused on the small screen of my phone and prayed for daybreak. At the first hint of daylight, when the leaves were green again and no longer black, I fell into a deep sleep. About an hour and a half later, the loud engine of a vehicle and the squeaks and groans of the boat and trailer it hauled woke me up. The campground had a boat ramp and the early fishermen were coming in. The flurry of trucks hauling boats didn't stop, so there was no use in trying to sleep. The little road to the boat ramp ran directly in front of the jeep. Michelle was already up and preparing her morning coffee. I could tell she didn't get much sleep either. We didn't sleep for 48 hours. No, we we're did just, not. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a sleepless weekend. At that moment, I wished I'd looked at my phone to see what time I'd seen that figure peering into the Jeep. Because she told me that about three in the morning, something brushed her tent right at her head. Yes, it did. <laughs> at that moment, I, uh, I told her about my two sightings of the figure I'd seen in the tree line and peering in the Jeep. I don't think either one of us was looking forward to another night there. <laughs> we had the conference too, still. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Exhausted from odd activity and sleeplessness, it took us longer to get ready to go to the PRT Dogman Conference 30 minutes away in Paris, Tennessee. We got there right on time to see my friend take the stage and share his encounters. He offered part of his time to another fellow to come on stage and tell his experience, and it blew Michelle and I away. We enjoyed more of the conference, buying books that interested us, and speaking with my friend and others in the paranormal investigating field. The conference was great, 
and everyone we spoke with treated us with respect and kindness. In a world where experiencers are typically treated like we are off our rockers, it was truly <laughs> wonderful to be with a group of people who would actually listen to you and offer support, encouragement, and advice. Like-minded people, that's where it's at. That's right. We hope to attend another one. Because we had forgotten firewood <laughs> and we brought dinner that needed to be cooked at camp, we left the conference before it ended to get the firewood and cook before it got dark. After hearing so many encounters, particularly the one in Dover where we were actually staying, our nerves were frayed a little bit more about the night to come. We stayed busy getting the fire going and preparing our dinner, watching as boater after boater pulled out of the water and left for the day, allowing a hush to settle over the camping area. After dinner and right at sunset, we walked to the edge of the lake to take some amazing pictures. For me, there was a much different feeling to this side of the campground, lighter and much less foreboding for whatever reason. It was. We returned to our campsite for our second night for sleeplessness. <laughs> our tired minds and bodies didn't allow us to stay up as late the night before as the night before, even though I do believe both of us kind of dreaded separating and trying to sleep. It's one of the ultimate vulnerabilities, being sound asleep, completely unaware of anything or anyone around you. There is no moment to prepare if something or someone decided to inflict sinister intentions. Exactly. My phone battery displayed a little over 50%, which frustrated me. I'd, reali I'd relied on watching my phone the previous night to help occupy my mind, and it wasn't in the cards for tonight. I turned my phone off for the time being, conserving watch time for later on when I knew the fear factor may be getting to me. I situated myself so I could peer out the jeep side window to look up through the dark leaves to the twinkling stars focusing on the possibility I might see the bright flash of a meteor. Far off across the lake, I heard a loud, drawn-out howl, and as soon as it stopped, coyotes started yipping. I live on a farm in a rural area, and I hear coyotes almost every night at home. The first howl I heard was too deep to come from a coyote. Yeah. It was loud. It was very loud. It was very long. It was very deep. As soon as my head hit the pillow, was when it happened to yes. <laughs> start yes. howling. Like, no sleep for you. <laughs> <laughs> my body stiffened for a moment, but I did not hear another howl like that one. Only the familiar chatter of the coyotes. Then I heard a conversation coming from Michelle's tent. Heard her speak a little louder. <laughs> hey, did you hear that? <laughs> I heard that, but I didn't hear her. <laughs> and sp she spoke a little louder than usual, but I couldn't make out what she said, but took it as she was on the phone with someone. The next morning, I learned that she'd heard that strange howl as well and had yelled out to me asking if <laughs> yeah, I heard it. yelled it out twice. <laughs> and I seriously thought she was just talking on the phone with somebody, so I, I didn't hear what she said. I just heard her speak, so I... I didn't realize she was asking me if I'd heard that how. Gosh. Um, let's see. Of course, my eyes barely closed for sleep, and around 2 in the morning, the forest went completely still. No sounds at all. I've read enough stories and watched too many shows and knew what yeah, this could mean. Weird. I waited dreading what I might hear or experience. But thank goodness, within a few minutes, the chirps and buzzes of the night insects began again. I finally turned on my phone to watch something and eventually drifted off to sleep. Yeah, when the forest went quiet like it did for a couple of minutes, I didn't like that at all. I was yeah. really expecting... I heard that too when I was laying in my tent sleepless. <laughs> yeah, I was expecting something more to happen, mm -hmm. so I was just stiffened up waiting. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness it didn't. Sunday morning at this campground was quieter than it had been Saturday. Only a few fishermen showed up to put boats in. After a couple of cups of coffee, we cooked breakfast, cleaned, and packed everything up. We wanted a few hours to explore LBL before needing to start the four-hour trip back home. There are so many side roads along the trace. 
Many are gravel roads that lead to cemeteries. Others are unmarked gravel roads, and some have locked gates. With both of us being unfamiliar with LBL, we really weren't sure which road to take. Two of the gravel roads we chose were marked as roads to cemeteries. One, I can't recall the name, we drove on for four miles and never found the cemetery. Well, there were so many offshoots. I, I didn't want to go any further or turn because I was afraid we'd get lost. Yeah. Yeah, there were multiple side roads. So if yeah. you didn't pay attention, there was no telling where you'd end up. Exactly. We chose to turn back. Once back on the main road, we kept trying to choose another side road to explore. But the signs are so small that by the time you're close enough to read them, you've passed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no signs out there. There's no homes. There's no businesses. There's no stores. There's nothing. There's no police no presence. Lights, no police presence. Nope. You're pretty much on your own. Yes, you are. Knowing we were getting close to the northern end, we swung left, randomly picking a gravel road. After a couple of minutes, we realized to our amazement that this was the exact road we'd explored on Friday evening on our way down to the campground. I told Michelle that obviously we were meant to be on this road again. We drove it further this time, passing a massive cornfield on both sides of us and veered to the right. This road began to get really rough, running out of gravel, and the deep ruts were too much to go any further. Michelle got out to take some pictures. Here it goes. Okay, Michelle got out to take some pictures, but I felt like I shouldn't be getting out. I didn't know why I felt that way, so I stayed in the Jeep and scanned the woods looking for tree structures. The day was beautiful with sunny skies, fluffy clouds, a light breeze, and temps in the low 80s. We couldn't have asked for a more perfect day weather-wise. And that's when I saw it. I stared, shocked that I was seeing a full-blown shadow person in the bright daylight in the middle of the woods. I'd only ever seen shadow people in buildings and houses, slyly slipping around corners and into the shadows, giving me just a glimpse. Not this one. It stood right by a tree in the middle of a damn sunbeam. The shape of this one was different than the one I saw on Friday night. The one I saw Friday night very much fit the outline of a typical Bigfoot, particularly the mounded head and long arms. This looked just like a featureless, deep, dark outline of a human. It moved around the tree a little and then moved upward, morphing into a different, indistinguishable shape. By this time, Michelle had made it back to the Jeep and I pointed it out to her. She didn't exactly see what I was seeing, but she took pictures. I took pictures. The crazy thing about that is her picture showed the dark shape while mine showed nothing. It made no sense. After this, our adventuring time was over. As we took the exit onto the interstate home, I think we both knew we'd had one crazy weekend that we didn't expect and the LBL left an imprint on us both. It definitely did. Yeah. We knew that we'd be coming back when we could. For so many, it calls them back. For some, it's the water and camping recreation. For us, it's the deep mystery that lies within its wild, unmanaged, miles and miles of woodlands. It holds many secrets that whisper tantalizing bits to those that listen. What will the LBL tell us the next time we visit? When we are able to make that trip, we will be listening, open to that conversation of high strangeness. Wonderful job. She did a great job writing that story. She didn't Thank miss you. a beat on it. <laughs> and it's all true, every bit of it. Yes, that is, so. that is our experience. We yeah. did not expect much to happen when we went down there. We just felt like we were going on a camping trip, typical camping trip, set up a campsite, go to the conference the next day. Yeah, this was my first trip to the Land Between the Lakes. I'd never been there before, so I mean, <laughs> it was 
extra an extra experience but uh, it's beautiful there but at the same time like from the time we got there we saw the crows I mean, yeah. there, were, there were just signs everywhere, structures. We found structures when we first got there. I yeah. Mean, yeah. The she signs were just everywhere. That place is so active. And we're definitely, we're going to go back when the leaves fall. Yeah. We're trying to make a, another, plan another trip. So hopefully we can maybe do some videos while we're there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, we just wanted to share our experience. And I hope everybody's having a great one. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.